Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Population Descriptors for Legacy Genomic Data Challenges and Future Directions Workshop. My name is Lucia Hindorf, and along with my co-organizer at NHGRI, Jonala Morales, we're so pleased to see so many of you. Over 550 participants have registered who have worked with over 70 genomic resources. I wanted to also thank our NIH colleagues. We could not have done this planning without our colleagues throughout the NIH. 10 institute centers and offices have participated in the planning of this workshop, in addition to co-sponsoring the NASM report that um, started off the idea for this workshop. We've also noted here those few who are serving as moderators and or note takers. So we're grateful for those of us who have helped plan and implement this workshop, as well as people who are having an active role at today's meeting. We're also thankful to our workshop co-chairs, Melissa Davis at the Morehouse School of Medicine and Malia Fullerton from the University of Washington. We'll have a chance to introduce you to them a little later. Jonella and I wanted to share that the planned outputs of this workshop are several fold. First of all, this meeting is being recorded and we plan to make the recording available to um, everyone to be able to watch and share with your colleagues after, after the workshop ends. We also plan to write a workshop report that will be publicly disseminated on our NHGRI homepage, as well as a, a peer-reviewed publication regarding the workshop recommendations. We also hope that this workshop will spark continued dialogue amongst those of us at NHGRI and with all of you, the scientific community. So before we get um, too far into the meeting, we just wanna go over some meeting best practices. So this will sound familiar to many of you who spend many hours over Zoom. So make sure your Zoom profile shows your name and affiliation. Your video and audio will be turned off by default because we have so many individuals, but we do encourage your active participation. So during the discussion sections and the breakout groups, you're encouraged to turn your video on. If you have questions during the meeting, please post them using the Q&A feature on your screen. The moderator for the uh, respective session will collect the questions and read them. And then if you are um, in an in a audio sort of role, please turn your audio and video on when speaking and state your name and affiliation. So I wanted to point everyone to a document that was made available last week on the workshop homepage. It's a breakout groups document. Just a heads up that we will be asking everyone to choose one breakout group later this afternoon to join. So be thinking about which one you might want to join as you're um, listening to the various talks and engaging in the discussion. Uh, I will just show briefly there, there, that there are 14 breakout groups. Um, we'll go over another orientation to the breakout groups a little bit later today, but please be aware that um, there are lots of opportunities for you to, cho to, um, to join the discussion, but you'll be asked to join one breakout group later this afternoon. And then just a high level overview of today's agenda. So after um, I conclude my remarks, we will have a talk on the workshop purpose and objectives followed by another talk on the population descriptors and genomic legacy data and the introduction to the NASM report as it relates to legacy data. And then we'll have um, lessons learned from the All of Us research program. So this is kind of our introductory sets of talks to set the context for the workshop. We will then have a brief break. And as I mentioned before, we'll have instructions for the breakout groups. So you all will have a sense of um, what you'll be asked to do and which breakout groups you might be interested in joining. We'll go into a panel on current challenges related to population descriptors and selects contexts. This um, general topic will form the basis for our breakout groups. So in the breakout groups, you'll have a chance to discuss additional specific challenges related to population descriptors and genomic legacy data. And then we'll have um, a rapid fire breakout groups report back um, at the end of the day. And, and um, it will feel fast, but just be assured that we'll have an opportunity to, to follow up on this discussions from the breakout groups in day two as well. Um, and then we'll end our day um, at 5 p.m. Eastern time today. So that's the overview of the workshop. And then we will um, move next to the next session here. And I have the pleasure of introducing um, the next set of speakers for our workshop purpose and objectives. So the first speaker um, is Vince Bonham. 
Vince Bonham is Acting Deputy Director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, a member of the senior leadership team for the Institute, as well as an Associate Investigator in NHGRI's Social and Behavioral Research Branch. Mr. Bonham provides leadership for NHGRI's health equity and workforce diversity programs and works in partnership across NIH to promote the mission of the Institute. And then we also have Dr. Sherry Shelley. Sherry Shelley is the Deputy Chief Medical and Scientific Officer and the lead for ancillary studies in the All of Us Research Program at the National Institutes of Health. Through her leadership, she is establishing ancillary studies as a core and scalable capability of the program that will expand the cohort and deliver new phenotypic lifestyle, environmental, and biological data to the All of Us Researcher, All of Us Researcher Workbench. And since Sherry, take it away. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, again, Vince Bonham from the National Human Genome Research Institute and here with my colleague, Dr. Shawley. Um, so we are happy just to talk for just a few minutes, a little bit to give you some framing of what has been happening at the National Institutes of Health related to the consensus study uh, as and really leading into this workshop that we're having today. So let me just start. Um, Everyone who's on this um, webinar workshop today is aware of the uh, consensus study report that was published in 2023 using population descriptors in genetics and genomics research, a new framework for an evolving field. But what not everyone may be aware of is what NIH is doing in response to that and, and really the background with regards to the consensus study that was led by the National Academy. So I provide you here the QR code. I know people have access to this, but I just wanna really start with the context of thinking about this workshop that we're starting today, uh, really coming from recommendations that came out of the consensus study, issues that the community has been struggling with for years and thinking about how we approach these issues. But I wanna just highlight that NIH uh, took the report uh, and recognize that the report has value to the agency. And I just wanna highlight here uh, this director's statement that was published in March of 2023 uh, that was signed on by uh, then NIH director, um, Dr. Lawrence Tabak, um, Dr. Green, and Dr. Ella, uh, Perez Stable at NIMHD, which articulates that this report will inform NIH's ongoing efforts to safeguard scientific integrity in genomics and promote responsible design of research studies so that all populations benefit from scientific advances. This was a message from our leadership at NIH that this is an important report for us to consider how it may be appropriately adopted uh, in any type of way by NIH. So I just want to recognize that that activity is ongoing at NIH, that there are efforts uh, to look at the 13 recommendations that were provided by the consensus study to determine whether there is appropriate policy changes that should happen at NIH. I want to recognize that there were 13 institute centers and offices of NIH that participated as sponsors of that consensus study. Each of them um, recognized the importance of that type of uh, exercise to consider whether there were recommendations that were appropriate for the field of genetics and genomics. And I just want to acknowledge all 13 of the institute centers and offices that participated in the development of the report from the perspective of providing funding. Uh, so with that, I want to give it over to Sherry uh, to talk a little bit about the workshop objectives. Thanks so much, Vince. So what are we going to do today to talk about uh, how we can use uh, the report to really guide legacy data? So the first is really understanding the report recommendations and considering how they uh, relate to the ongoing use of legacy data. We want to be able to summarize current approaches to uh, the use of population descriptors for legacy data. We want to define challenges with the current approaches in harmonization, interoperability, analysis, including genetic similarity, which is mentioned in the report. Address challenges and identify potential solutions for those challenges. Develop practical recommendations that can be widely adopted by the scientific field. And identify opportunities for future research or collaboration. Next slide, please, Vince. 
This has been a, an ongoing trans NIH effort. And you can see here all of the wor wor workshop co-sponsors, including all of us, the National Cancer Institute, NHGRI, Institute on Aging, Child Health and Human Development, um, Diabetes and Digestive Kidney Diseases, Environmental Health Sciences, Nursing, and um, the Offices of Biobehavioral and Social Science Research, as well as the Office of Science Policy. This is definitely something that um, NIH as a whole, you, you saw Vince mentioned the, the statement that went out in March. Uh, this is one step towards um, helping the research field understand how we might use uh, the NASM report. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and we definitely want to acknowledge um, the co-chairs for this workshop. Very uh, pleased that Dr. Melissa Davis and Malia Fullerton are, are willing to serve as co-chairs for this event and both have great expertise and grounding in sort of understanding the NASM report and how it might apply. And then you've already heard from Lucia, and um, we also want to thank Jonella Morales as the NIH staff co-chairs who have really been championing this and, and really um, making sure that the, all the groups that were represented on the previous slide had a voice at the table. And of course, the NIH planning committee, which Lucia showed before. So. Um, with that, I am happy to uh, turn it back over to Lucia, who is moderating this session. Uh, if we could take any questions or anything, I think we have a few minutes about the objectives of this meeting and what we hope to get out of it. Yes, that's exactly right. Thank you so much, um, Vince and Sherry, for your support um, and for your remarks today. We do have uh, a, a, couple min a couple minutes for questions if people would like to add anything in the Q&A. If you're like me and you're puzzled by this new Zoom, Zoom interface, you may find it under more. And then you can click um, Q&A or there's, there could be a Q&A button as well. Okay, I don't see any questions. So why don't we go ahead and move along to our next session, uh, which I will pass along to my, my co-organizer, Jonella Morales. Jonella Morales, go ahead. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the two co-chairs of this workshop, without whom this would not be possible. They have given us expertise, time, a lot of feedback, and so I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce them to you. Our first co-chair is Dr. Melissa Davis. And Melissa Davis is the inaugural Georgia Research Alliance Distinguished Investigator at the Morehouse School of Medicine, where she serves as director of the Institute of Genomic Medicine. Dr. Davis is an international leader in genomics and health disparities and received her PhD in molecular genetics at the University of Georgia, where she completed groundbreaking work on developmental functions of steroid signal, gene regu regulation, and model organisms. Welcome, Melissa. Our second co-chair is Dr. Malia Fullerton, and Malia Fullerton is Professor of Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Washington School of Medicine. She is also adjunct professor in the University of Washington Departments of Epidemiology, Genome Sciences, and Medicine, as well as an affiliated investigator with the Public Health Sciences Division at the Fred Hutchinson uh, Cancer Research Center. Malia received a PhD in human population genetics from the University of Oxford and later retrained in ethical, legal, and social implications research. Welcome, Malia. And with that, I'm excited to introduce this, sesh this um, talk on population descriptors and genomic legacy, legacy data. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that very uh, kind introduction, Janella. Let me just uh, pull up my slides and start sharing my screen. Um, well, where, where I am, it's still morning, so good morning uh, to everyone here on the call. We're so delighted that you can join us to participate in this incredibly important conversation today about the use of population descriptors 
in genomic legacy data. Um, I am going to lead off our joint presentation today, and then I'm going to hand over uh, the, the PowerPoint baton to my colleague, Dr. Davis, uh, who, will, who will round off our presentation. So um, I, I wanted to sort of start out, we've already had this really great uh, introduction from, from Vince and from Sherry in terms of you know, how important uh, the issue of population description is to the National Institutes of Health. Um, what are we all doing here today? Why have we decided to take time from our very busy schedules to participate in this virtual meeting? Well, um, the main what of the meeting today is trying to think about how to use population descriptors responsibly in a particular context, this context of the use of legacy data. And I will talk a little bit more about what we mean by that in just a second. Who? Um, Broadly, the genomics research community, but really anybody doing research which in uses genomic information as a variable. And of course, uh, genomics is entering wide use all over the place. And this is part of the reason why uh, so many different ICs and offices are interested in this issue. And why? Because the NIH and uh, indeed, you know, uh, public support has allowed us to accrue legacy data over now, frankly, decades, uh, which, which remain with us and remain a valuable resource uh, for various genomic applications. So it's, it's important that we not uh, lose sight of this information, and we need to figure out how to do so with integrity and uh, responsibly in the ways that Vince articulated. Um, I see one thing in the chat. I just want to make sure. Okay, perfect. Um, what is meant by the term population descriptors? Well, just in case anyone here has not read the report out of the National Academies, uh, the definition of population descriptors, uh, which is used uh, in, in that report, um, is a concept or classification scheme that categorizes people into groups, sometimes referred to as populations, according to a perceived characteristic or dimension of interest. So examples could include uh, uh, self-identified race, uh, racial description, uh, at race or at ethnicity, geographic location, um, uh, understood ancestry, genetic ancestry. Uh, there's a long list of examples of ways in which we could classify and describe populations. And this was the, the remit, of course, of the National Academies report. We will probably see this picture, which is the, the cover of the consensus study report uh, multiple times today. As Ben's mentioned, the report was published in 2023. Um, and um, as was detailed in that report, uh, there was uh, part of the rationale for the consensus study to happen in the first place is that investigators, including genomic investigators, often use population descriptors inconsistently and or inappropriately. And um, that inconsistent use might on its face not seem to be a big problem, but past misuse has promoted inaccurate and frankly racialized, inappropriate racialized thinking about population groups with direct and indirect implications for patients in their communities. Um, this, is, this is consequential how we describe our study samples. Uh, we will hear more from Jen Wojcik, uh, a member of the consensus panel in her presentation following ours, and so she will tell you more specifically about what the report contained. Uh, but importantly, and part of the reason that we're meeting today, is that approaches to population description in the context of the use of legacy data were not directly addressed. It was a very long report, it was a very comprehensive and important report, uh, but it put to one side this question of legacy of the use of legacy data. So what do we mean when we use the term legacy data? Um, well, um, the organizing committee in conjunction with us, the co-chairs had a fair amount of, con of, 
uh, you know, I think constructive discussion about this issue because it is a term that has been used for a number of years, but is not necessarily widely defined. And this is how we choose to understand the term and how we're hoping and expecting people will make sense of the term over the course of the next two days. So we define legacy data as data collected in the context of a defined epidemiological or population-based or related investigation for which direct contact with study participants, in other words, the people who donated the data that we're using in our work. Uh, so direct contact with study participants regarding population descriptors is in many cases no longer feasible, either due to time elapsed the fact that the data have been de-identified to protect people's privacy interests or other factors. So this is how we're thinking about what legacy data mean. Um, and as Lucia already mentioned, we are hoping for your active participation. You've already seen this picture once. Go to the website, uh, the, the web, web address is there, download this breakout groups document and begin to think about which breakout group that you're going to jo join later today. And then we're going to have a series of breakout groups tomorrow that Melissa is going to talk about. But please take a look at those. Uh, and the, the, the particular focus of the breakout discussions later today are focused on challenges that might arise in the context of trying to work responsibly with population description when using legacy data. Include things like meta-analysis of legacy-only data, legacy plus non-legacy geno genomic data, reference genomic resources, the necessity of using non-genetic inferred labels and that when we're using legacy data, prioritizing amongst multiple population descriptors, defining other in our use, the use of admix populations, tools for reusability and interoperability of legacy and non-legacy data, technical approaches to assigning population descriptors, how we think about population descriptors as we're monitoring diversity, avoiding misuse of labels, use of legacy data with ambiguous consent, changing existing population descriptor labels that might already attach to legacy data sets, and and then the role of considering community preferences as we move forward in our use. So it's a very meaty list. Every single one of these challenges was actually suggested by people who are going to be sitting in those groups. And I think we're looking forward to your detailed and active conversation about this. So very quickly before I hand over to Melissa, we can think about various examples of falling under uh, various categories. So with regard to something like monitoring diversity, we have the GWAS catalog, for example, which catalogs all of the results of various genome-wide association studies. Um, here's a, a copy of an image from a report, actually, uh, that Janella was lead author on a few years back, uh, You know, thinking of the various ways in which cohorts which have been labeled with particular, sometimes very specific labels, kind of get rolled up into various categories. What are the right categories? How do we reference multiple population descriptors as we're trying to monitor diversity? If we're trying to conduct a meta-analysis of legacy plus non-legacy genomic data, such has been the case in the in context of the NHLBI supported TopMed initiative. This is a picture from the marker paper that came out from the TopMed study a few years back. Um, and different legacy data sets have been incorporated as part of that very large scale, incredibly important project. Some very broad, referencing ethnic group categories such as African American, others quite specific, such as referencing Amish uh, uh, communities, as are cultural religious communities, uh, or national communities such as Samoan or Mexican or Costa Rican, right? So how do we think about these issues of population description and use uh, population descriptors responsibly? And then if we're working with multiple types of population descriptors, as is the case now in the context of the prime consortium, trying to do polygenic risk score development in the context of cohorts that have been um, previously ascertained. As shown from this paper that was published earlier this year in Nature Review Genetics, we have genetically inferred information, genetic similarity information. We also have self-identified race ethnicity information, but this is complicated for us in the context of the PRIME consortium because, of course, PRIME is collecting cohorts internationally, and the same kinds of understandings, social understandings of race and ethnicity that might apply in a North American context don't necessarily apply in Asia or in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. 
Uh, so this is just a very quick overview. I probably have taken more time than I should have. I now would like to turn over uh, to my colleague, Melissa Davis, and just thank you all in advance uh, for your uh, active and engaged participation as we talk about this very important issue. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully, my slides are showing appropriately. Let me switch to the presentation mode. Sorry about that. Okay. So thank you, Malia. It's been great working with you. Um, my daughter's name is Malia, so um, absolutely um, uh, appreciate um, having a, a model for her. Um, to, to see how very broad science is in STEM. So one of the things that we will discuss today is really how we all approach utilizing our populations for the sake of whatever the studies are. We have a very broad range of researchers today. Um, and what I hope to convey in this next five to six minutes is well, basically why we need population descriptors and if we need population descriptors. descriptors. Um, our vision for utilizing population genetics and health disparities research, and I'll give you an example based on the research that we've done on triple negative breast cancer. And then largely what we want to do is help everyone really figure out how to decide you know, what types of descriptors you need in order to stratify your population to achieve the purpose of your studies. And I think that's going to come across um, repeatedly throughout the day. And then we'll end with what we'll be discussing. So the power of inclusion and diversity in precision medicine is really the vision, right? We want to make sure that we are not only being inclusive, but utilizing the diversity in the populations to ensure that, for instance, in cancer, in the cancer continuum, that we're able to fully understand the breadth, if you will, of the breast cancer risk that exists in the, in the population. But beyond that, also whether, whether or not we fully understand all the molecular pathways that are driving, for instance, clinical outcomes based on perhaps our lack of understanding molecular pathways that haven't fully been investigated. So our rationale for using genomics and racial disparities lies in the first problem that we observed, which is that breast cancer mortality is more than 40% higher for African-American women than US women in the United States. However, this isn't just a racial problem, uh, or at least it's not just um, a socioeconomic problem. So we know that racial disparities is often correlated with poverty. So of course your socioeconomic status does define in large part what you have access to in terms of uh, risk prevention uh, and of course therapeutic outcomes. But what we note in the United States is that if we were separate the population based on race and whether or not patients lived in poor or affluent counties, black patients who live in affluence still have a higher mortality rate than white patients who live in poverty. And so based on that information and having a, a lack, if you will, of genetic information underpinning this population, we decided to take a global approach using a concept my research partner, Dr. Lisa Newman, coined as oncologic anthropology. And what we noted across the globe is that every population um, or every country, if we could separate the mixed population by ancestry, it was the African component particularly sub-Saharan African component of the population um, that had the highest rate of triple negative breast cancer. The highest rates globally are actually in sub-Saharan Africa. And so noting that, for instance, this population across the African diaspora is very unique due to certain historic events such as the, tr the transatlantic slave trade. We know that the continuous gene flow across these populations is unique. And so what we want to do is try to harness this admixture across the globe to identify, for instance, regions in the genome that are shared in terms of patients who have these very aggressive forms of triple negative breast cancer. So in this context, what we already understand is that there is a global bias in the onset of a particular biological subtype of breast cancer that hasn't really fully been uncovered. And we know that this population shares a lineage across the globe. 
Now, in our own research, we actually conducted our studies in both ways. We first started with self-identified race, basically to just try to define whether or not there were differences in biological con um, context for triple negative breast cancer between black and white patients. But we also used genetic ancestry. And what we found was much better clarity in terms of gene networks that were associated um, with the differences in tumor biology in these two populations when we used ancestry instead of race. Now, even still, though, we, we can appreciate that even when we take away the European background and look primarily in patients who have common genetic ancestry, we found that there were race-associated differential express genes. And those race-associated genes were actually, well, the imprint of comorbidities that at a population level have a bias of burden in, for instance, African-Americans uh, compared to Africans. And those comorbidities included diabetes, obesity, cardiac dysfunction, and all these things were imprinted on the tumors, creating a unique biology. And so then if we think about what we what what actually well is the um, result of the social construct of race, we know in the United States there's historic marginalization that then this systemic racism impacts, for instance, where someone can live. And where you live then also impacts your exposures. And we also understand that exposures can also change biological responses, particularly in the case of cancer. And so now what we need to really hone in on is how both ancestry and the social construct of race has a gene interaction with the environment that could potentially be driving these unique um, biological differences. And so in day two, we'll dive even further into these particular concepts, because as you know, in some cases, especially with legacy data, you may have a wealth of information about the environment and you may not. Um, you may have information about, or enough genetic information about um, the, the health outcomes or the um, um, genetic background or ancestry of populations, and you may not. It really just depends on the data cohort. And so we'll discuss how, if your, if your um, research questions are related to molecular and functional characterization, gene discovery, health disparities, human evolution, population genetics, or even non-health outcomes can be informed by, well, this very um, comprehensive decision tree. And you'll hear more about the decision tree. I just want to point out at this point that most of the decision pathways lead to, instead of genetic ancestry, genetic similarity. But there are cases such as the ones where we are interested in um, whether genetic data can allow us to unravel um, whether or not certain health disparities impact uh, outcome where you would use um, genetic ancestry. Uh, particularly if you understand, for instance, the um, background of the patients that you're studying. And so these guiding principles that we've been given by the NASM report and the continuing discussions that we have certainly have the um, capacity for both synergy and tension, because we know that the rationale for selecting specific population descriptors can affect the principles of responsible research, and this is taken directly from the NASM report. But we also know that the specific context of research may not always be responsive to the community preferences. And we also have to con contend with the fact that there are evolving best practices for with each generation admixture changes. And so over time, and especially once we actually hone into what we're looking for in terms of molecular genetic underpinnings, we may no longer need to use certain descriptors. And we also need to consider, for instance, in terms of community preferences, the power imbalances that certainly um, still apply in research, um, inherent in academic research, and consider the potential vulnerability of the individuals who are enrolled in these research studies, just as um, Malia mentioned earlier. And so with that, um, we can end. And I will hand the mic over to our moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Malia and Melissa, for that great presentation. I feel like we've learned a lot already. Um, there, We are basically out of time, but there is one question that was asked in the chat. And oh, and a second question. So if you would be so kind 
Um, if you're able to answer the question in the chat or sorry, in the Q and A, that would be fantastic. And that way we can continue the discussion. And with that, I thank you again, and I will pass that on to our to my colleague, Ebony Madden, who will moderate the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Joanella. It's already starting out to be an amazing um, workshop. I've really enjoyed the um, initial presentations. I am pleased to introduce um, our next speaker, who is Jen Wolchek. Um, she is an assistant professor of epidemiology at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, which is in Baltimore, Maryland. She's a statistical geneticist and genetic epidemiologist. Her research focuses on methods development for diverse populations, specifically in admits populations. And uh, the majority of her research is um, focused on improving statistical methods for complex trait mapping and polygenic risk scores for these populations to address existing health inequities and ensure downstream translation for all. So I'll give it to Jen. She's going to introduce um, and give an overview of the NASM report. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Ebony, for the great introduction. Um, and so I think you should be able to see my screen. So I'm here to give sort of a whirlwind tour to the report, which is um, over 200 pages. So sort of here, we're going to give you the cheat sheet for what's going on. Uh, and so uh, this committee was formed about two, almost two years ago at this point um, to review and assess existing methodologies, to look at the benefits and challenges in the use of race, ethnicity, and other descriptors in genomics research. As stated earlier, the report was uh, published last year, last March of 2023. Uh, and the picture, which again, as was stated earlier, I'll see a billion times today. Um, I think it's important to note beforehand, this was a group project, obviously, and, and it was um, a great group that was very diverse in terms of expertise, uh, coming from many institutions, many backgrounds, and I think the report really benefited from that. And so here are some, all of the names for that report. All right. So this is already stated as well, uh, but just to, to sort of emphasize what this is, we're talking about, um, when we're talking about a population descriptor, it's this concept of difference, right? For, for classifying individuals into groups or populations. And again, it's about a perceived characteristic or dimension of interest, right? So it's about what you think the relevant point of difference would be between people. And for this report, um, we focused on descent associated descriptors, which means you know the large, the big ones are race, ethnicity, and genetic ancestry, but it also includes other descent associated categorization systems such as clan, caste, tribe, indigeneity, um, and others that are in the report. And so for that, I think it's important to take a step back and sort of see what we currently do in the literature. This is from the GWAS catalog. A few years ago, there was an effort to um, harmonize the existing GWAS. And sorry, I was checking the chat to make sure I wasn't missing something. Uh, to, to harmonize existing GWAS, right, in terms of their ancestry and group membership for these descriptors. And so what I'm showing you here is an example from the GWAS catalog, this paper in 2018. And here we see for European, it includes descriptors such as European, which is sort of based on geography, sort of continental level geography, Caucasian and white, which is sort of these racial categories, um, smaller groups within this, including Dutch, so nationality, and then also these measures of genetic similarity or genetic ancestry, such as clustering with reference populations, in this case, thousand genomes or HapMap. And so you see sort of the state of the field requires us to use very different constructs to harmonize across um, into this data. And so this really goes to show sort of the challenges that we have, particularly with legacy data, as to what has been captured in the past and our sort of challenge moving forward to both harmonize it, but harmonize it in a meaningful way. Right. And so why do we need the report? So this is, you know, why this is why do we need the report when this was commissioned and when this was conducted? Um, and I think this is part of a continuing conversation we have uh, within our fields, as well as sort of society in general for the issues surrounding race and racism in science and society, right? Particularly, you know, there's been a lot of conversations within race-based medicine, and there was a need to address it within genetics and genomics research. Um, again, you know, there's also a change in the field in which these sort of large-scale data sets became more accessible and widespread, and they also became more diverse. So there's maybe more of a need to include 
um, better descriptors for these populations. And then the revolving preferences, both in terms of the participants, as well as researchers' understanding of those preferences. Uh, and again, this also comes on the tails of the FAIR data principles were published a few years ago. And so there's a big emphasis in this report about transparency and the need to have this level within our research when it comes to population descriptors. And so, you know, through discussions, there were several problems that were identified, these themes and the use of descriptors. Uh, one of them was typological thinking. So typological thinking is the idea that humans can be grouped discreetly into these innate categories. Uh, a good example of this is the pervasiveness of these continental ancestry groups that we use that often just recapitulate racial categories. And so this was sort of one of the problems identified. Um, and then building off of that, there was a continuing use of race, which is a scientifically invalid measure of human genetic differences. And so this could stem from the use of these categories of reporting from the OMB categories, which also just changed. Um, and so these were seen as being harmful and erroneous when it comes to human genetics research. And so we need to be careful about that. And then also, you know, as geneticists, we always want to say that everything is due to genetics, um, but that's not the way the world works, um, unfortunately, for, for our grants. But uh, so there's a, a neglect sort of acknowledge that there are environmental exposures um, that are that are important as well. And so usually within the research, they found that um, these social constructs being used as poor proxies for these environmental exposures instead of just uh, being used directly. And again, this is sort of par for the course for the variable and inconsistent use in the literature. And so um, the report is extensive and I encourage everyone to read it. There's a lot of information there, uh, but it's sort of split into two sections. The first section describes sort of how these descriptors have been used, the past and current use. I'm um, really going through the origins and how things are set up right now with definitions. And then the second half or the second section uh, is really focused on specific recommendations. Now these recommendations are um, anchored in these guiding principles, which I'll go into in a second, as well as requisites for sustained change. So the ability for these recommendations to remain flexible, but also grounded in these requisites and principles to allow um, things as, as you know, the world changes to allow this framework to still be useful. And chapter five and six have specific recommendations about the use um, and then some suggestions for implementation and accountability for interested parties within this system. All right. So, you know, as I mentioned before, one thing for us to note here is that there are six guiding principles that underlie this entire report. Those principles are respect, beneficence, equity and justice, validity and reproducibility, and transparency and replicability. So all of the requisites, all of the recommendations that come through this, all of the suggestions for implementation here, they're all grounded by these guiding principles. So try to stay true to all these guiding principles throughout. And then, you know, sort of stemming off of that, we have the requisites I mentioned before, which is uh, avoiding typological thinking, environmental factors to be measured, and engaging communities. And then we separate guidance out for researchers into different kinds of research, the big categories, and then recommendations for implementation for the multiple parties involved in the system. And so these requisites to sustain change fall along these sort of three categories. Again, to avoid typological thinking, this misconception that humans can be grouped into discrete innate biological categories, uh, when in fact, human genetic variation is very complex and there's no um, such thing as these sort of true innate categories. And these are addressed by recommendations one through three. The second requisite is to measure environmental factors. And so virtually all phenotypes result from both genetics and environment. Uh, and often descent associated population descriptors are not good proxies for these environmental effects. And therefore research should use those variables specifically to more precisely capture the information that you're actually trying to get at. And that's recommendation four. And the last is really to engage communities and participants. So this is misperceptions about human genetic variation and group identities, uh, and they can have real harm on these individuals and communities and need to be addressed. And then also, when it comes to workforce diversity, research teams should include experts in community engagement to integrate these perspectives. And that's recommendation five. And so through a lot of discussion, you know, I think this is um, a big strength of the report, while also I see it making things more difficult for all of us moving forward, is that there was no sort of 
one size fits all solution. It really depends on what your research question is. And so for uh, this report, it's separated out into these different categories of research. Um, they loosely fall into gene discovery versus trait prediction, both Mendelian and complex traits, more mechanistic studies, looking at health disparities, and then human evolutionary history. And so really, you know, this puts the power back in the researchers' hands as decision makers of how these populations are described and defined, really, um, and that there needs to be a transparency for that. And so you can find recommendations in here. The recommendations for these and sort of what to use for what questions are presented in multiple formats for this. Uh, here is a table about sort of what concepts or constructs would be used for these different study types. Um, and some considerations to do when you're thinking through it, the process, uh, but it's important to sort of set it up as sort of, it, it depends again on your research question. All right. And so, whoopsies. And so one of the big, you know, there's a few, I think more conceptual topics that need to be brought up and discussed um, before moving forward. And one of them, when it comes to being more precise about what you're saying, what you're describing, is this shift from genetic ancestry group to genetic similarity, right? And so um, for those of you who are familiar with identity by descent versus identity by state, it's this idea that we don't actually have identity by descent for most individuals, that we don't actually have the genealogical history to say people's ancestry, but what we're actually mentioning, what we're actually measuring is the similarity between individuals. And so you can see this as sort of, we actually are looking only at the cross section of human history for most studies. Um, this is of course an exception if you actually have that information, but you're looking at the cross section and we don't actually have the information going further back. And so to just be specific about what we're saying, right? We're actually saying these individuals are genetically similar to each other or genetically similar to a reference group um, and not say that they're grouped by their ancestry, which is not what we're actually directly measuring. And so because of this, there was a particular focus about avoiding genetic ancestry groups. Um, it violates requisite number one, so avoiding typological thinking. Uh, it also insinuates that there is some underlying discrete group that's related to history or ancestry um, and can reify racial categories. And so um, that's sort of a concept I think for us to note is sort of these ideas of when you even when you switch to sort of genetic similarity, there's still the danger of sort of reifying these racial categories, depending on the granularity to which you ascribe these different these differences. And I really want to point out an example from the literature here um, in which, you know, the, the authors for this paper did use genetic similarity uh, and they discuss, they discuss a clustering algorithm they used. And so I think it's important to look at the highlighted bit here about how they arbitrarily assigned African over European, Hispanic um, over European, Standing over East Asian, et cetera. Um, and what's important for us to know is that none of these assumptions are made in a vacuum, right? We all bring our assumptions and our, our biases and our sort of the social part of it with us to our jobs. And what we see here is that, you know, this actually directly recapitulates the social theory about the axes of insubordination. And so I think it's important for us to note that even though we shift to this genetic similarity and these algorithms space, we're still bringing these biases into this space um, and need to really think them through. And this is why transparency, I think, is really important when we're describing these groups uh, moving forward. All right, I have minutes left. And so I'm gonna briefly go over what this means in practicality for legacy data. Um, John tomorrow will go over this in much more detail, but this sort of meant to be an intro to get you thinking for his presentation tomorrow. And it's important to know that there is a resources for you online. This is a decision tree available on the website. It's a step-by-step -step guide to help you in the appropriateness of descriptors. And again, it's dependent on your data and your question. So just keep that in mind. And so, you know, there are recommendations for individual level data and for group level data. So here is recommendations for individual level data. You go through and you click and you say, you know, it's going to ask you, do you, are you collecting new data or are you collecting, ex are you using existing data, right? Which is the legacy data in this case. And if you're using legacy data, individual level, uh, the recommendations are to review consents and the community agreements. And then you need to follow those existing consent structures using the available da data um, and again, for the transparency and the reproducibility, it's neat when you create these new labels to share and describe the formation. So that's sort of important to keep in mind. Now it gets, I think, a little bit <clears throat> more complicated for group level 
So the, this flowchart asks you to evaluate whether existing group level descriptors will produce valid and trustworthy results or will be misleading, right? So you have to ask yourself that question and ask yourself that question honestly. If the answer is no, the recommendation is to not proceed with the study. Now, if the answer is yes, then um, the recommendation is very similar to the individual level data, but to emphasize the limitations of the pre-existing descriptors um, and to if any modifications are needed to share and describe them, right? So the transparency again on that front. And so it's really important for us to think through this. You know, we, we are beholden to the data we have when we have legacy data and you're just trying to do the best that you can do with that data. And sometimes that means to not use that data, uh, which, you know, I think it's a hard decision to make, but I think, you know, going through these frameworks rigorously can help inform that. And we'll see more about this in John's um, discussion and talk tomorrow. And one thing is, again, I think relevant to legacy data, not standardization, right? So there's not one framework for everything together. Rather, it's about harmonizing um, between different studies or different sources of data. And this includes the need for a lot of information. And this includes metadata. So, you know, the recommendations, this is box five, too, if you're interested in the report. You need to have the overall rationale for descriptors and labels, um, a set of possible values and recommended abbreviations. And then for individual level, again, having the label value and also the provenance of the label. So this includes self-report, estimated, because each one of these can have their own sort of intricacies and biases being brought to them that we need to know moving forward. And so that's sort of a, a, an aspect to be note moving forward. And again, not standardization. There's no one taxonomy of humankind, um, but rather harmonization specific to the research question at hand, right? So the idea is you have as much data available to you as possible, and the researcher has the ability to go in and look and see what's appropriate for their questions. And again, this is meant to be flexible. It's a resource to be flexible with these different use cases to allow that tailoring of the purpose for the study. And this includes you know, having all the data available and also the transparency, this, this movement from <laughs> acknowledging where the reference data comes from, right? So um, instead of on the left-hand side saying you portion the genome into European versus African tracts, you would say instead into tracts that are 1,000 genomes European-like or 1,000 genomes African-like. So there are some differences in terms of the actual wording for that, but the idea is acknowledging the specific reference data you're, you're doing, which is, again, just being very specific to what was done and not some sort of abstract idea. And so I am out of time. So what I'm going to just wrap up and say, this sort of really goes for this need for precision, right? Again, the report really emphasizes that this is not just about the words that you're using for these populations, but how you define them in the first place and how we include them in our research. Uh, it should also be specific to the question at hand, right, for the analysis and study. Um, and if you are stratifying to having a justification for that, right, again, not relying on sort of this is how it's done, but rather why are we doing this? What, how does it suit the question? Is it valid, et cetera? And, you know, I think one thing that we can do in this space, and I really look forward to in this workshop, is sort of questioning these defaults that we have for the need for stratification, the need for only inclusion of some groups, um, because I think that, you know, this report really shows that there are some things that can be questioned uh, and really done better when it comes to population descriptors moving forward. And I am out of time, but again, here's another QR code in case you haven't gotten the first, you know, 30 times to see it or the report. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Wonderful presentation as always. There is one question in the Q&A, but I think you answered that in your presentation. The question is, um, what is the recommendation to describe local ancestry? You gave an example of that. Um, and so I'm sure there will be opportunities for discussion later. Um, we're right on time, actually. So Great. I will hand it off to the next moderator, which is Leah Mechanic. Thank Hi. you. Hi, thank you. So uh, this next session is lessons learned from the All of Us Research Program. So we'll start with uh, two short presentations, which will then be followed by some time for Q&A. I ask that you uh, put your questions in the Q&A box. 
So first I will introduce our two speakers and then I will turn it over to them. So our first presenter is Dr. Eric Borwinkel, who is the Dean of the UT Health Houston School of Public Health. Dr. Borwinkel's expertise is in both human genetics and statistics with an emphasis on large team science programs. A large part of his current research effort consists of localizing genes contributing to disease risk using modern genome-wide mapping methods. Under his leadership, School of Public Health faculty and trainees have made groundbreaking discoveries on the epidemiology and genetics of cr common chronic diseases. Our second speaker is Dr. Angie Music, who is the director of the Scientific Data Strategy Branch in the Division of Medical and Scientific Research in the NIH All of Us Research Program, charged with maximizing the scientific integrity of research data collected on or donated by all of us participants to achieve the broadest impact for biomedical discovery. She is also the program director for the All of Us Genome Centers, overseeing all genomic data production pipelines and workflows for data release in the All of Us Research Hub. And with that, let me turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So I'm going to kick us off, and then I'll um, lateral it off halfway through to Angie, who will um, continue on. Um, so it's a great honor for both Angie and I to be here. So thanks to the organizers um, for allowing us to have a few minutes. It's a great honor. So as was said, um, we're here representing um, the All of Us program. I think you all would know that the All of Us program is a large, some would say the flagship precision health program for um, the NIH, if not the U.S. science. Uh, this one slide, I tried to capture um, some essences of the All of Us program, uh, very much, you know, thinking about theme for today's talk. So th there are kind of three areas that are highlighted here um, in terms of the mission of the program. One is to nurture partnerships. Um, there's both partnerships of the program with its participants, uh, partnerships with many organizations um, that sort of surround those participants and even part, you know, partnerships with the private sectors um, um, as we go forward. Uh, ultimately, and I, I would say what most people think about is to deliver what could be the largest and richest biomedical data set, certainly in the United States, um, and, and deliver that to the scientific community um, and, and making sure we're doing that to reach the broadest possible audience, including experts like, you know, on today um, and also citizen scientists and, and do that in, in, in a secure manner. And then on the right hand side, um, really, and in, in, in the one that I, I have to say I enjoy the most is to try to use the, the data and the infrastructure to catalyze a, an ecosystem and that ecosystem as com, you know, components of researchers, that's what we're used to, but researchers, communities, uh, the participants and the funders, basically all working together um, to drive discovery. Um, a little bit of an update. These are numbers as of March 11th, so they're, they're relatively uh, up to date. You can see the geographic distri distribution on the maps on the right. Um, there are 775,000 people, um, 775,000 people, it's 100,000 people um, that who have signed up. If we think about um, basically data that will be driving discovery downstream, probably the two bubbles on the right are maybe the most important numbers for you. There are bio samples on 550. Um, 100,000 and also electronic health records on 431. So it's a very large data set um, and, and it's, it's an ongoing study. So also in terms of the, the themes for this program, it's sort of a mixture of um, you know, legacy data and ongoing collection um, using the definitions that were provided earlier. In, in terms of data types, um, on the one hand, you could argue it's not that much different um, than many other studies. On the other hand, um, and I'll point out some of the areas where I think it's, it's quite unique. 
Um, one is um, there's a large emphasis on environmental exposure and social determinants of health, um, mostly um, um, at the moment at least, that's um, self-provided through a variety of surveys. I wanna call out social determinants of health, particularly related to a, one of the previous talks. We're trying to do our best to measure, again, self-reported self-determinants and also environmental exposures. There are a variety of physical measurements, uh, again, a variety of biosamples for those that are interested, um, including um, blood components, um, urine, and, and also discussions of other biosamples going forward. There is a major emphasis on trying to leverage technology and wearables um, to collect data. And there's also a major um, emphasis on looping back to the top of using the electronic health record uh, for each individual to look at um, both clinical and other data going forward. And I'll say more about that in a minute. And when you think, e even though at the moment there's been a, a single um, exam for those that are enrolled, and, and uh, I'll repeat, it's an ongoing study and ongoing enrollment, it's interesting to think about one's own, think about your own electronic health record. If you have one, that it, it is indeed sort of retrospective, so it's longitudinal going backwards. So it is uh, possible for some measures to think about um, incident disease um, by, by moving sort of the baseline point um, backwards in terms of the electronic record itself, as long as the primary variables and covariates haven't changed over time. If they're time dependent, it's a clearly a, a cross-sectional measure. This shows you the, the depth. I don't wanna go through this in huge detail, but notice, you know, for example, disease conditions themselves, they're 84 million data types. Um, so it's a, it's a rich, very rich data source that, that is available. Um, as I've already hinted, um, there's a, a large um, component of, of ascertaining individuals who are traditionally underrepresented in biomedical research. Um, on the right, it gives you some um, indication about 47% are, are, are non-white. Um, if we look at income, um, there's a 23% are below 25,000. I'm trying to skip around a little bit. Um, there's also a great interest in, in enriching for those that are sort of non, um, in terms of sexual orientation, quote unquote, non-straight. Non um, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about labels, I think, today and, and tomorrow, um, and also sort of gender identity, um, making sure we're, we're being inclusive of those and how they're um, described. The panel on the right uh, is sort of a color diagram of, of certain sort of self-described race groups. Um, you can see um, the blue would be white. Um, it's still the majority, um, but if you think about other genomic studies on the bottom, um, certainly the program, I think, is doing very, very well in sort of reaching out and trying to enrich um, for those that are UBR. On the one hand, there's, there are challenges then if you think about what is the population of inference. It's certainly not a random sample, um, but, but on the other hand, it's probably not st strictly a convenient sample since one can try to construct weights um, to make inferences of the US population, although it is difficult. Um, a little bit about availability of the data. Um, it is available in a, a tiered manner. Um, on, the, on the top are data, mostly aggregated data, so-called so summary statistics that are available in a public related tier. Um, raw data is available for those in a registered or a controlled tier. For this audience on the right, you'll notice that the genomics and health-related data is in a controlled tier of, uh, on what we call the, the researcher workbench. I'm very pleased to be part of this genome, genomic network or genome centers. 
that are collecting the genomic data, whole genome sequence data on all of the, all of us are appropriately consented, all of us study participants. Um, I happen to be associated with the Baylor Hopkins group on the right, um, which is, you know, led by Richard Gibbs with Kim Doheny um, at Hopkins and myself at, at UT. We also work very closely among with the Genome Sciences Group in Seattle um, and also the Broad Institute um, in Cambridge. Um, the return of results is uh, the operations are led by color, both um, Scott Topper and Alicia Zhao shown there. So a little bit about um, sort of the, the richness of the data. Um, as was mentioned, you know, we've got more than 400,000 um, surveys. We have electronic health um, data on 287,000, and we've collected um, whole genome sequences on 245,000. And really all of these data then are put onto um, the researcher workbench. They are available to researchers um, in the United States and internationally now um, for basically querying and, and um, asking important scientific discussions. Moving forward, there is a large effort um, to make the data also available to not-for-profit companies. A little bit about, I think one of the most exciting things that we're doing is really pioneering in a, in a very large scale how to return genetic results to study participants. And this is a good example of that partnership, partnership um, among participants and, and community organizations, partnerships uh, with the genome centers, partnerships with human subjects, um, regulatory bodies, and partnerships with the FDA. Um, so there's two types of, of data types that are returned to individuals. So this is individual level. One is what we call engagement and engagement genetics. These are interesting um, or concepts that we think the participants may find interesting. They've indicated to us they would find them interesting, um, but they're not exactly health related. Then um, on the right is a little bit about what we're doing in terms of return of um, results. Um, in, in this case, clinically important results. It's the ACMG version 2.0 are returned and plus pharmacogenetic information. So it's a combination of genetic interpretation and the drugs that individuals might be exposed to. I do wanna give a shout out to really the whole program and many, many, many hours of work working through the details of return of results at this scale and interacting and making sure we have appropriate um, permissions in place to do so. So the, and the reference by the way is gonna be on the next slide. There is what we're labeling as a marker paper. It's called Genome Data in the All of Us Research Program. And these are the next three or four slides actually just give you a, a summary of some of the, um, the figures that are in the paper. And then when I turn it over to Angie, Angie's going to give you a little bit deeper dive into some of the things we're doing um, moving forward. The uh, panel on the on the left gives you a description. Again, um, it was already discussed by sort of labels that are tend to be sort of continental um, in, in nature. And so those that are African-like um, adopting that word, for example, this gives you uh, frequencies by the size of the bar for those that are, you know, sort of rare um, and a little bit less, more frequent. Also, I want to give you a call out the, the number of variants. Um, you know, it for those of you who you know can't put commas in that quick, that would be 320 million different variants, for example, in the African-like um, study pool. So you can see it's a very large sample and a very rich data resource. On the right um, is showing the average number of pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants on a per individual again, by using the same types of labels that were on in the other slide. By now you're probably used to these types of data. And it, it's interesting in terms of the meeting that we're at um, today and tomorrow, it's a, it's a real balance. These numbers are a real balance between 
um, likely pathogenic and pathogenic variants in the individual, plus what is in the reference databases, which today tend to be quite Eurocentric. And so it's a, these numbers are really a, a, a tension between those two forces. Um, here, the reference is given on the top, by the way, for those of you who don't know the paper. Um, we did um, spend a lot of time um, estimating genetic similarities in a, in a very large data set. Um, I do want to emphasize that, you know, trying to project um, similarity in a simple um, 2D plot in 250,000 individuals with whole genome sequence data it, it, it's, it's not an easy it's not an easy task, and it's um, it, it necessarily it, one has to make choices and sometimes even compromises. And then also, there's a lot of methodologic nuances. I don't think this meeting really is going to be a sort of a, a similarity or um, kind of methodologic meeting, but but it is important to respect some of the methodologic nuances that, you know, principal component analysis themselves basically are made to sort of maximize, um, have, have simple metrics, linear metrics that maximize the diversity, explain the diversity among individuals. And then how you choose to project them in a figure, um, the first version of the paper and Angie's, Angie's going to talk about things going forward. A method called UMAP was used that seeks to provide or and preserve um, sort of details of, of neighborhoods, and particularly neighborhoods um, in the edges. And it, 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 the method then also tends to tends to exaggerate differences. It's intuitive. You know, it's very intuitive, but it's also extremely difficult um, to interpret and and frankly, not a whole lot of practical utility. Um, I was very interested in uh, Malia's talk. You know, uh, one of the things that I've learned in this field is words matter. You know, and even if you think about, we've only been meeting for about whatever, an hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes, and we're all using these different words and how we interpret them. It's, it's, it's fascinating, even as a professional. But, you know, do we how we use genetic ancestry, which many of us, um, you know, we've been almost trained to use it um, and we're, we're shifting to genetic similarity. Um, what is the utility of, you know, self-reported race and ancestry versus uh, a categorical ancestry predictions and uh, emphasizing the word predictions. And also then how to project very complicated data in a simple graph, you know, we feel, we feel we need to communicate to the scientific community nuances in the data. And, and even when we're doing it, um, very often um, I feel that we trespass on some of those ideals that we say we want. And um, one of the examples, you know, is how do we, how do we look at admixture? For example, um, you know, we've seen these plots already today. Um, where you've got individuals stacked across the x-axis and percent, uh, again, by some um, continental defined ancestry. And we're used to looking at them, but, but again, the labels and how we talk about them, I, I think it sometimes is challenging. Um, other things that are in the paper moving maybe away from um, the uh, emphasis on for today and tomorrow, but I, I feel obligated there there was basically a um, genome-wide and phenome-wide association analyses carried out uh, for multiple traits and, and loci of interest. I'm not going to go through these in great detail. Not a whole lot of surprise. There are, there are some unique, quote-unquote, discoveries just because of the, the sheer sample size. Shown on the left is um, LDL cholesterol. Again, not a whole lot of surprise if you work in this field on the, the sort of peaks around chromosome 19. And also the Duffy blood group, again, not a whole lot of surprise um, knowing um, the influence of that locus on, on white cell biology. And then I'm gonna, happy to turn it over to um, Angie, who's gonna sort of take this and the data that I've shown in the paper and try not to editorialize so much and take it forward and what the program is doing now, Angie. Thanks, Eric. Next slide. 
I think you're running my slides. Yep. yep. Thanks. So uh, as Eric uh, highlighted, we published our uh, initial marker paper in February. And the goal of the paper was really to describe the research resource that we were putting out to the world and um, you, doing some preliminary analyses to show the research utility, the data quality, and data availability of this really unprecedented uh, data set in size and diversity. And on the right, you'll see the figure that was included. Um, it was figure two in the paper that uh, displayed uh, genetic ancestry through the UMAP and then overlaid uh, self-reported race and ethnicity in groups. And then did a an estimate of admixture with the panels on the right within those self-identified uh, race and ethnic groups. Next slide. So. We got a lot of feedback. There was a lot of uh, conversation, I'll say, on Twitter and X when this paper came out. Uh, a lot of feedback that was direct and some that was indirect. Uh, I just wanted to pull out this one that uh, someone sent to me uh, from the AMIA Summit this spring uh, in the 2024 Translational Bioinformatics Year in Review, uh, where they, they uh, do an extensive literature review of the past year of, of major um, uh, accomplishments and sort of what the trends are in the field. And AOU got a shout out for our paper. Next slide. So it started off nice with, uh, you know, highlighting the key takeaways that we're announcing this data. It's, you know, 245,000 clinical grade whole genomes, 77% of participants are from underrepresented communities, about half are from underrepresented racial and ethnic minorities. We've discovered hundreds of millions of new variants that are not reported in any data set, almost 4 million of them with coding consequences. Uh, and then we demonstrated uh, that the data makes sense and found high replication rates um, in these uh, GWAS and FIWAS analyses. And the uh, summary level data is publicly available. Great resource for the world. Next slide. So uh, they uh, highlighted some of the key um, accomplishments of the paper, which um, um, Eric already showed you, that this uh, data set will enable ancestry stratified phenome-wide dissociation analyses and uh, analyses into health disparities. Next slide. And then the next slide really highlighted uh, the dislike of the figure that we chose. Um, and uh, really laid out the, the pros and cons, mostly cons, uh, where it, the UMAP distorts distances, it's sensitive to parameters, loss of global structure, non-deterministic, meaningless axes values, scalability, and overemphasizes clusters of biases. So we heard you, we heard the feedback. Um, we, as a program, take this very seriously given our core values and the integrity of the program and our focus on inclusion and diversity as a whole across the program. Next slide. So the two main concerns that we heard uh, uh, quite a bit was one, this um, overlay of the computed genetic ancestry with the self-reported race and ethnicity that could lead to conflation of these constructs. And then two, this use of the UMAP tool to display these results, which, as I said, exaggerates dissimilarity, may be difficult to interpret, and could give people the wrong impression that populations fall into, into discrete biological categories when that is not the case. Next slide. So what are we doing? So we are being transparent in addressing this feedback. Um, almost immediately, uh, Josh Denny posted a statement on our website about the paper, and we prepared talking points for our partners and put a note in our participant newsletter and prepared the support center for any participant inquiries. We did make the decision to revise the publication, which is what we are working on right now, um, because we felt it is important for the reputation of the program to address these concerns and correct the situation. So as part of this, we decided that um, we would 
we would uh, send out any modified version of the paper with the modified figure and associated text to a number of outside subject matter experts who could serve as sort of pre-reviewers of this revised figure and text uh, before we send it back to nature for their peer review. Um, we got a really great response. The responses were thorough and constructive and reviewers uh, expressed gratitude for the steps that we're taking in um, making these adjustments. Next slide. So this is uh, the revised version of the plot that we sent out to this group of esteemed uh, reviewers. And um, essentially we've replaced the UMAP plot with a more standard PCA plot that most of us I think are used to looking at. And um, here we have uh, put all of the all of us participants in gray so that they are not categorized um, within this this system. And um, then we colored the, the uh, dots by the uh, reference populations in the um, metadata um, hierarchy of um, those uh, harmonized data sets from thousand genomes in, in the HTTP. And then in panel B, we did a slightly different take on the admixture estimation uh, within the categorized groups based on where they fall within the PCA. And we changed the labels to be uh, consistent with the NASM report, um, indicating that these are likenesses to um, these reference populations. Next slide. So we got feedback on that, and the uh, the admixture analysis continued to be somewhat problematic. We heard a lot of, um, I'd say, grumbling, or um, it wasn't very clear for the why. Why were we doing this? And so I think back to many of the points that have already been made today, the context matters and the intentions matter. And what is the research question and utility of doing any particular analysis? And we didn't feel that we had fully made the case of why this was an important uh, thing to include in this paper. So now we've decided to do away with that um, admixture analysis and stick with our PCA plots that everyone seemed okay with and um, just have more of them. So now we've got uh, a number of different panels showing different aspects of the of the PCs. So you've got uh, PC1 versus 2 and then 1 versus 3, 1 versus 4. So you can start to see um, how the the different rotations of that uh, multidimensional space separate out different categories of people based on the reference populations and where the AOU participants fall within that. So we very much, you know, appreciate um, all the feedback and uh, are viewing this as a learning opportunity and knowing that these are very real and um, current uh, discussions that are going on in terms of how to best display this data. And we're open to other suggestions or feedback. Great, uh, thanks. Thank you, Eric and Angie, for walking us through this paper and uh, the, 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 the thoughtfulness about um, how the program uh, responds. Um, I had a question um, that came in from Melissa Davis about, um, she was asking about um, whether or not this means the self-reported data is no longer included in the paper or is it just included differently? It's included differently. So we'll just describe um, sort of the, the proportions of people who report um, the different uh, race and ethnic categories. Great, thanks. I, I had a, another sort of big picture question because uh, and, and before we go into the break is, you know, what do you think, you know, uh, would be really helpful for researchers going forward with implementing population descriptors based on some of the, what you've learned in this process? Or do you have any sort of what guidance do you think researchers may need? That's a, first is a great question. I, I would say you know, the timing was a little bit difficult in terms of when this paper was written and first submitted versus the National Academy report. 
But I think the relevant question, though, or the, rele the relevant part to it is um, the be you know making sure um, that you're getting a diversity of opinions and the diversity of voices are being heard um, in in shaping these kinds of of um, results and and making sure um, in a program as large and complex as all of us there there are um, you know sort of groups and making sure we're getting input across the, the rich diversity of the investigators and the participants. And again, it's not easy. You're, the, it, we're we're going to experience over the next 48 hours, we don't all agree. Um, and, and just because the, the, the National Academy of Report is out doesn't mean we're all going to follow like lemmings. And so, you know, it's it's as was said in the introduction to this meeting and in the report itself, this is a rapidly changing field. Um, and so I would say for me, I, I'm, I'm speaking selfishly now, um, getting a diversity of, of input um, in the field. And also has already been said, context matters in terms of the question and what I said in the earlier slides, these words do matter. Um, and spending time and being careful about um, giving precision to the words you may, we may as professionals, we use them a little too loosely um, and making sure there's precision in the definition. Thank you. Uh, so I know we're a little over time and into the break, but there are a number of questions that came in right at the end. So um, I hope that you, uh, and Shari's been uh, answering some of these, hope you can go into the Q&A box and, and respond to some of these questions. That'd be really helpful. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Janella or Lucia. Yes, thank you, Leah, and thank you to Eric and Angie for a fantastic session. Um, we are going to take a break now, so if everyone could be back by 35 minutes after the hour, whatever time zone you're in, we will reconvene then. Thank you.